I'm Kurt with Channel Frederator, and I'm going to compare the two different approaches taken by Dragon Ball GT and Dragon Ball Super when it came to crafting a sequel to the beloved Dragon Ball Z. Uh, don't worry though, unlike Dragon Ball Z, I'm going to cover everything from start to finish in one episode, and not like 20. <laughs> In 2013, the legendary Dragon Ball returned with Dragon Ball Z Battle of the Gods. Fans were delighted to see new Dragon Ball material for the first time in over 15 years. For many, the film was a welcome return to Dragon Ball Z, a series that helped define 90s kids' childhoods, mine included. The movie was popular enough that it led to a full series, Dragon Ball Super, that picked up where Dragon Ball Z left off, beginning with an expanded version of the Battle of the Gods storyline. But this wasn't the first sequel to Dragon Ball Z. In the mid-90s, Dragon Ball GT began airing in Japan. GT was a sequel that took some major creative risks and ultimately was poorly received by many viewers. When GT first began airing in Japan, it was as if the first episode of GT picked up right where Z left off. However, despite the fluid transition, the story of GT was the first show to be based on the material not originally written by series creator Akira Toriyama. Toriyama was in the mix, however. He contributed story and new character designs. Ultimately, GT had a relatively short run of 64 episodes, compared to Dragon Ball Z's 291. Toriyama's involvement in Dragon Ball Super is more of a collaborative role. While he isn't exclusively in charge of writing or character design, he still creates characters and plot elements that are incorporated into larger stories. Super has already outlasted GT with 131 episodes, with the series continuation currently unconfirmed. American viewers who wanted to see Dragon Ball GT for the first time, outside of reading about it in fan forums or in Beckett Dragon Ball Z Collector magazine, had to wait until the series began airing on Toonami in 2003, a full seven years after it debuted in Japan. Watching Super in America has been a much more forgiving experience, as viewers didn't have to wait at all. Subtitled Japanese episodes were released concurrently in America and Japan, while a dub featuring the classic group of American voice actors has been airing on Toonami since January 7th, 2017, for those who prefer the anime dubbed or are nostalgic for the voices of their childhood. Dragon Ball Super picks up almost immediately after the end of Dragon Ball Z's Majin Buu saga. Gohan, for example, is about to be a new father at the series' opening. His wife, Videl, is still pregnant with Pan, who has already been depicted as a four-year-old in Dragon Ball Z's epilogue saga. Bulla, the daughter of Vegeta and Boma, who shows up in DBZ's epilogue and GT, also has yet to be born, only showing up as a newly born baby mid-series. Dragon Ball GT, by comparison, starts 10 years after the epilogue, and Pan is not only 14 years old, but featured as one of the series' primary three characters, alongside Goku and Trunks. And Bulla, while not a main character, is a tween and shows up from time to time. The biggest change made by GT is that at the series' opening, Goku is transformed into a child due to an accidental wish by classic Dragon Ball villain Emperor Pilaf. Since Goku is reverted to a child, which if we're to assume, means he's around the same age as in Dragon Ball, which would make him about 12. Trunks, who is first an adult male from the future, then later a present day child in Dragon Ball Z, is the oldest of the central crew at just 23 years old. Weirdly, really, this also means most of the fighters from the previous series are initially weaker in GT. Goku's powers are weakened as he's transformed into a child, and Pan and Trunks simply haven't had the training to become as powerful of Saiyans as the heroes of DBZ. Important characters from GT are also sidelined like Vegeta and Gohan, who've settled down into more domestic lives, rather than keep up their training. This is symbolized by Vegeta rocking a mustache, in case you didn't believe he hadn't truly gone full dad yet. While Super is similar in this regard, with Gohan pursuing scholarly studies, for example, he is not fully given up on saving the Earth, and is still a formidable fighter, choosing to continue his training in order to protect his family. Vegeta is still very much in the picture too, maintaining his rivalry with Goku, which pushes both characters to get stronger and stronger throughout Super. The rivalry somewhat taking center stage in many of the series arcs. Super, however, makes some singular changes to what is established in DBZ. Supreme Kai, for example, who fused with his attendant Kabito midway through the Buu saga, utilizes the Namekian Dragon Balls to undo the fusion reverting him back to his original appearance and reintroducing Kabito as a character. Super, however, makes some of the singular changes to what was established in DBZ, and the two remain that way through the balance of the series. Additionally, King Kai is dead, still sporting a halo from the time Goku teleported an exploding cell onto his planet, and constantly reminds Goku of this fact, maintaining a running joke in the show where the hapless Goku is yet to revive him. The biggest addition to the world of Dragon Ball is Beerus, the god of destruction. Originally, Beerus was introduced in Battle of the Gods as a new villain, and while he retains this role essentially in Super's first arc, he eventually more or less joins the side of the good guys, and his position as the universe
universe's most powerful deity and warrior and forms much of the plot of many of the subsequent arcs of the series. His attendant, Whis, is originally introduced as something of a foil, but when the series advances past the ground already covered by Battle of the Gods, he steps more into his own and is revealed he was Beerus' teacher, leading to his training of Goku and Vegeta. A couple of arcs later, another god of destruction and Beerus' twin, Champa, is introduced, leading to the revelation that there are 12 universes in total. In Universe 6, the twin universe to the seventh universe in which the series up until this point has taken place, then becomes the source of many of the show's new characters, including some new Saiyans and Namekians. Eventually, heroes and villains from the other universes are woven into the series as the arrival of Zeno, the king of all 12 universes, Universes is introduced, opening the show up into a true multiverse. Another addition entirely new to the Dragon Ball world is Galactic Patrolman Jocko, who first visits Earth to warn of the return of a resurrected Frieza, and is revealed to already be friends with Bulma. He quickly becomes part of the crew, though he's mostly sidelined as comic relief. Perhaps one of the most curious additions to the DBZ epilogue saga is Oob, a reincarnation of Kid Buu, or Majin Buu's evil half was now good, but supposedly retained some of Boo's power. This would seem to suggest a significant addition to the series, however, Oob is only mentioned a couple of times in Dragon Ball Super, getting much less screen time than good Boo. While he appears in GT as a competent warrior, having been trained by Goku, he's ultimately just a side character. Oh, and the Pilaf gang returns, still up to their shenanigans collecting the Dragon Balls and somehow working for Bulma? You can't have a Dragon Ball series without awesome transformations. Dragon Ball GT essentially introduced one new level of transformation, Super Saiyan 4, which is attained not through powering up through each previous Super Saiyan form, but by transforming into a golden version of the Great Eight form, and then powering up from there. The return of the Great Eight was something of a throwback to Dragon Ball in the early days of DBZ, as this bestial Saiyan form was eventually abandoned, with the show Saiyans cutting off their tails to prevent the transformation from ever occurring again. Super Saiyan 4 looks completely different than any Dragon Ball transformation of the past, or future for that matter, as it's something of a middle ground between Super Saiyan, regular looking Saiyan, and Ape, but with red ape fur for some reason. Thanks to Super Saiyan 4, we eventually see some DBZ level action in GT, with the ultimate culmination of this transformation being Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta, which anyone like me who visited Dragon Ball themed GeoCities growing up knows as the most powerful Saiyan possible at the time. Aside from the mythic Dragon Ball AF's Super Saiyan 5 Goku, of course. All of that would change though with Dragon Ball Super's new transformations, which introduced Super Saiyan God, which is more powerful than DBZ's Super Saiyan 3, as well as a series of increasingly powerful transformations building off of it. Super Saiyan God is first introduced in the fight against Beerus, and is only possible through a ritual involving five other Saiyans, one of whom happens to be the unborn Pan in Videl's belly. It turns Goku's hair and eyes red, and gives him a generally younger demeanor. This doesn't get a whole lot of play, however, a Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan is introduced in the very next arc, and looks similar to the original Super Saiyan form, but with blue hair instead of yellow hair. A mouthful, yes, and later redubbed as Super Saiyan Blue. While the idea of a Super Saiyan God was first introduced through a vision witnessed by Beerus, which acts as a catalyst for his visiting of Earth and informing the Saiyans of the existence of such a powerful form in the first place, the addition of the powerful deity Beerus and his teacher Whis eventually leads to Goku and Vegeta learning from Whis how to harness divine energy in such a way that they not only no longer need the ritual to transform into Super Saiyan God, but can even transform directly from Vanilla Saiyan to Super Saiyan in blue. While this is more or less the cap for Super Saiyan forms, Goku is the first to improve the form's power, utilizing the Kaioken technique in a throwback to the pre-Super Saiyan days of DBZ. Kaioken can multiply its user's power by up to a factor of 20, but now, rather than multiplying his base power level, he's multiplying the power of Super Saiyan Blue, though it's also quickly shown to have a strain on his body. Vegeta eventually gets his own powered up version of Super Saiyan Blue, achieving a limit break of sorts in a battle against Jiren. Goku is also taught a skill by Whis that comes into play around this time called Ultra Instinct, which is more of a focusing of power and reliance on instinct than a direct power up like Vegeta's Limit Break. But yet again, another way to make the already insanely powerful Saiyans even stronger. After awesome transformations, the next most essential ingredient for a quality Dragon Ball series is its villains. Most of Dragon Ball GT's primary villains feel like throwbacks to ground covered by DBZ. In GT's first saga, the villains are a series of aliens almost akin to Frieza, the primordial Dragon Ball Z villains of sorts. Then its first big villain is Baby 
who is something of a throwback to the major big bads of DBZ, sporting multiple forms like Frieza, Cell, and Boo before him. Concave ears somewhat similar to Frieza's and a small, muscular alien physique similar to Kid Boo. His creator is Dr. Mew, who is not only a figure similar to DBZ's Dr. Zero, but even teams up with Dr. Zero to bring back a stronger version of Android 17 the villain straight out of DBZ. That arc also features an appearance by Cooler, Freezer's brother, who had before only ever been a villain in non-canon DBZ movies. Something unique to Dragon Ball GT was the introduction of consequences if there are too many wishes from the Dragon Balls. Too many wishes unleashes the Shadow Dragons, a formidable group of opponents, but are almost all defeated by Goku. Following the trend of villains becoming heroes from DBZ, like with Android 18 or Good Boo, and even extending back to Dragon Ball, which first introduced Yamcha, for example, as a momentary antagonist, some of the first villains in Dragon Ball GT are the Para Para Brothers, an early throwback to Dragon Ball's levity who fight through the power of dance. Eventually, they basically switch sides and help Goku defeat Lord Lude, the series' first big bad. Basically, the DNA of DBZ was strong in GT's villains. That's the case in Super 2, which, returning again to THE DBZ villain, if there ever was one, brings back Frieza, first introduced through an arc where he's revived and achieves a new golden Frieza form, eventually even becoming a recurring character outside of his resurrection arc, and fighting alongside Goku and friends in the Tournament of Power. Also participating in the Tournament of Power and first introduced in its predecessor tournament between Universes 6 and 7 is Hit who becomes fast rivals with Goku, improving his signature time skip technique significantly throughout the course of his first fight with Goku, introducing a rivalry built on respect between the two fighters, which leads to the two characters working together later on in the series. In a move similar to GT bringing Cooler into the mix, Dragon Ball Super introduces a proxy for Broly, who is a recurring movie-only villain and another Saiyan you're very familiar with if you used to visit DBC GeoCity sites. The dude looks strong. Since he ever only appeared in movies, his place in the Dragon Ball world is non-canon. However, the introduction of a new Saiyan planet in Dragon Ball Super allowed them to incorporate Kale, who wears an outfit almost identical to Broly's and sports identical Super Saiyan hair, even retaining a similar legendary greenish-yellow tint. The one significant difference being her gender. Eventually, a primary villain emerges in the Tournament of Power in the form of the cold and prideful Jiren, a warrior from Universe 11 who is the final obstacle between the warriors of Universe 7 and a wish from the newly introduced Super Dragon Balls. And following with the series' trend, even Jiren is not entirely villainous, caring deeply about his own universe, to his own detriment. Though by the end of the tournament, he seems to have learned a few lessons and if the series continues, will likely be something of a friendly antagonist, like Hit. Maybe. With the introduction of a multiverse, gods of destruction, and a new cross-universe tournament, there are enough new villains and general antagonists in Super to warrant their own video. Oh, and there's an evil Goku. More on that later. Those aforementioned gods of destruction and the new universes in Dragon Ball Super do a lot to flesh out the world of Dragon Ball far beyond ground covered in previous iterations of the franchise. Beerus is the series' initial antagonist, and the first god of destruction introduced to viewers, which is a godly being that's something of a foil to the godly Kais who protect their respective universes. The gods of destruction destroy planets or alien races in order to balance creation with destruction. Once the idea of 12 universes was introduced to the series, each universe with its own god of destruction and supreme Kai, the world of Dragon Ball was essentially multiplied times 12. Additionally, following the trend of returning to classic elements of DBZ, one of Super's arcs is centered on the return of future Trunks and a villainous Goku of sorts named Goku Black, which is sort of the perfect idea for a Dragon Ball villain. Take the strongest sand warrior in the universe and make him evil. Just like in GT, Android 17 comes back too for the 12 universe wide tournament of power, but as a hero this time around, having been keeping watch on a wildlife reserve on a remote island. GT introduces a new set of Dragon Balls too, right off the bat, the Black Star Dragon Balls, which are also a stronger version of the Dragon Balls. The Dragon Balls, from which the series gets its name, are also the basis of GT's climactic arc, which turns a series convention on its head as the Dragon Balls are no longer just a source of wish granting, but capable of unleashing a powerful evil in the form of one evil dragon per Dragon Ball. As this was meant to be the conclusion to all of Dragon Ball at the time, it makes a certain logical sense that Dragon Balls themselves would spawn the series' climactic big bad villains. Meanwhile, Super introduces its own set of Dragon Balls called, naturally, the Super Dragon Balls. Each of these is as big as a planet, and they're located in both universes 6 and 7. Super Shenron, the new wish-granting dragon summoned by gathering all of these new humongous Dragon Balls, is as big as multiple galaxies, and his wish-granting 
training capabilities more powerful than that of Shenron and the Namekian Purunga introduced previously. It's commonly known to fans of both series that the original Dragon Ball is more lighthearted and comedic while Dragon Ball Z is more serious, or as serious as a series about power levels and evil aliens can be, Dragon Ball GT attempted to capture both these sides of the Dragon Ball coin by opening the show with a newly young Goku on a classic hunt for the Dragon Balls. It's tone, lighthearted, and fun before introducing some new world-threatening villains. With Goku being younger, the GT series feels like it was set back to that time of Dragon Ball, quite literally with Goku being a child again. Power levels are down too. Rather than juggle all that came before it, Dragon Ball Super attempted something simpler, a return to the lightheartedness of Dragon Ball. Beerus, for example, who was introduced as a being with powers greater than ever before seen in the world of Dragon Ball, is also the source of a lot of slapstick comedy, thanks to his gourmet appetite and cat-like indifference to things. There are multiple direct callbacks to Dragon Ball and DBZ, whether it be Krillin and Goku talking about their growth and their friendship, or Master Roshi reminiscing, literally showing footage from Dragon Ball, and the OG fight between Goku and Frieza getting a fresh makeover in new animation. They reanimated key parts for Super. In addition to looking to its past, Super makes some updates to the formula as well. For example, introducing a significant number of powerful female characters, which the series had totally been lacking outside of a few notable exceptions, giving the series a firm foothold in the present and into the future. There is now a whole lot of Dragon Ball between the original series, its iconic sequel, and the two sequel series to that sequel. Poof, that's a mouthful. By the way, while it's widely assumed that GT is no longer canon, there's been no official statement by anyone of importance, so feel free to pick whichever sequel you prefer, and consider that the true continuation of the Dragon Ball franchise. I'm Kurt with Channel Frederator, and thanks for watching. You have a favorite part of either series that we might have left out? Please let us know in the comments, and don't forget to click that bell icon to become part of the notification squad. Make sure to check out our other videos and subscribe to Channel Frederator. And if you like my sultry voice, you can check out my channel, Kurt Ritchie. You might just like it. And remember, Frederator loves you.